All right, everybody, welcome back to another video. Um, before we get started, I just want to quickly say uh, this is being filmed in the middle of April 2020, so it's pretty obvious what's going on in the world right now. We're all having a pretty rough time. So uh, before we get started, I just want to say that I wish my best to you and yours during this time, and I'm hoping that my videos can provide some sort of distraction for you. Uh, I'm going to continue trying to upload them as regularly and consistently as I can. Since Northern Brewer is open, you can still get brewing ingredients there. Uh, and that's what I've been focusing on. So as long as they will ship, I will continue to put videos out. So please sit back, grab a beer or two, and enjoy uh, together as we dive into this Citra Double IPA. So uh, yes, yeah, Citra is one of my favorite hops, and I think it's been long overdue for me to do this in a single hop IPA. So uh, today, we're going to get that checked off. Citra was one of those original hops that... Uh, started the whole uh, juicy IPA revolution. Uh, Citra is one of the original New England style IPA hops, and it also appeared frequently in West Coast style IPAs. Now the two styles of IPAs really do have uh, very little in common outside of having a lot of hops in them. Uh, your West Coast IPAs are clean, typically clear, fermented with a standard American ale yeast, and uh, more focused on the bitter qualities of those hops uh, versus the flavor and aroma additions, although those are still present. Typically, you're going to see that with a pretty basic malt bill, uh, but sometimes can tend on the uh, darker side of the spectrum. So you typically see additions of like Munich malts or darker caramel malts sometimes will also show up in your West Coast IPAs. Uh, because they try to blend the hops and the malt coming together uh, into a bitter but very still enjoyable beer, on the other hand, the New England style IPAs are totally different. So typically, you're going to see those with that characteristic haze, uh, high protein malts in that bill, giving you a uh, not a very clean, but a, a full bodied mouthfeel. And they're fermented with English ale yeasts, uh, which throw off a lot more of those fruity esters. And the whole point of this style of IPA is to extract as much possible juicy flavor and strong aroma additions from those hops and completely avoiding that bitterness as much as possible. Both of them are great beers and I've brewed both of them. You want to check out the videos for them. They're going to pop up here in the corner uh, if you want to look at those on your own time. But today we're going to be brewing something that is a little bit of a hybrid uh, between the two styles. This is going to tend sort of towards the west coast end of things, um, but it's still going to have a whole bunch of those late boil and post boil uh, hop additions to bring out as much juicy flavor from the citra as possible. So I'm also going to add some flaked oats in there for some high protein content in the grain bill, uh, giving us a little bit boost in uh, mouthfeel there. So hopefully this is something that can show off the best that citra has to offer just by putting it in at multiple points during the boil, during a whirlpool, and then post boil as well uh, for a dry hop. So we're going to be aiming for a pretty high ABV on this guy, somewhere between 7.5 and 8% hopefully. Um, and a relatively high IBU count as well, at least mathematically speaking, uh, of about 84 IBUs. So it's going to be important to have a decent amount of malt to back up all of those IBUs, otherwise we end up with a very, very bitter beer. And that can overpower the late boil additions if we're not careful. So let's get into this recipe here. So we're going to start out with 12 pounds of pale two-row base malt, uh, and then we're going to add a pound and a half of flaked oats. And you're going to see these... These are legitimately not flaked oats from the brewing store, by the way. I actually am just using straight up Quaker rolled oats from the grocery store. You'll find that this is far cheaper and easier to acquire, especially during times like this. Um, I'm adding a pound and a half of Pilsner malt that I actually just had left over. So that's purely to just get our gravity points. Um, I had that left over from my cream ale I did a couple weeks ago. And uh, one pound of Crystal 10, one pound of Munich malt, and then just to get our ABV finely tuned in, uh, about 0.3 pounds of table sugar. So shooting for an OG of about 1075. Uh, for hops, yes, the star of the show, all citra here. All of my citra is about 11.9% alpha acid. So at 60 minutes, we're gonna bitter with an ounce and a half. At 20 minutes, we're gonna add an ounce. And at zero minutes, we're gonna add an ounce. That alone is gonna give us a lot of strong bitterness, but also substantial hop flavor. But next, we're going to do a Whirlpool. The Whirlpool is going to be held at 180 Fahrenheit for a total of about 30 minutes. And every 10 minutes, I'm going to be throwing in an increasing amount of Citra. So with 30 minutes left to go in the Whirlpool, I'm going to add 0.6 ounces. With 20 minutes left, I'm going to add 0.7. And with 10 minutes left, I'm going to add 1.2. So for the water profile, I'm going to be focusing on a profile that brings out a lot of that hop bitterness. So a higher ratio 
of sulfate to chloride, roughly 2.3 uh, to 1. So you're also going to see a higher amount of calcium in there to kind of aid in getting a good smooth mouthfeel out of this. So with my water profile, I'm also using city water, which means that um, I have to often add a lot more salt uh, to get to the proper ratios of things. Um, so you're gonna see higher ion counts in this water profile versus starting with reverse osmosis water. So unless you live in my town, I highly recommend that you calculate your own water profile for this particular beer. My advice on that is just to keep that sulfate higher than the chloride by roughly two to one and add a little extra calcium in there and keep your residual alkalinity rather low. I did a video last year on water chemistry. If you wanna check that out, it's gonna pop up here in the corner. Might make some of what I'm saying here easier to understand. Uh, so I have 73 parts per million of calcium, 28 parts per million of magnesium, 65 parts per million of sodium, 233 parts per million of sulfate, 100 parts per million of chloride, and 50 parts per million of carbonate. And in order to achieve that water profile using my own base water, uh, I am adding 10 grams of gypsum, 10 grams of epsom, and 1 gram of chalk. For yeast, we are going to use a big starter, a tried and true Y yeast 1056 American Ale yeast. Uh, 1056 tends to really make hops shine in a beautiful way. I found that even though it's supposedly the same Chico strain as USO5 dry yeast, I've just gotten consistently better results with a 1056 liquid yeast. Um, and uh, I'm going to stick with it. I harvested this 1056 off of uh, another beer that I did with it a couple months ago and made a big old starter of it. Uh, so it's rocking and rolling and ready to go today. We're mashing at 150 degrees Fahrenheit for 60 minutes. Uh, mashing this at that temperature is going to encourage a higher attenuation, uh, which is important for getting the high level of ABV that we want out of this. I know a lot of people ask about my water and my volumes that I use. Um, I'm going to be honest, it's going to be dependent on your own system. All right, I typically start with about 11 gallons of water total. I treat that all with my salts. Uh, and then with a Camden tablet as well, which will remove the chlorine or chloramines from the water. Um, both of those things could ruin the flavor of your beer. Then after that, I let off about two gallons of that into a separate container, and that's gonna be my sparge water for later. Uh, so we're looking at about nine gallons, eight, eight to nine gallons typically is where I start with um, when I dough in. So then I basically get as much liquid as I can out of the first runnings and then we use that second bit of water, that sparge water, heat it up to about 170 degrees, batch sparge with that, and then we come out with um, ideally a pre-boil volume of about eight to eight and a half gallons, um, which again depends on your boil off rate, depends on how many hops you're using, depends on whether or not you try to suck up all the junk from the bottom of the kettle. I don't. So there's going to be a lot of things that fluctuate to give you your volumes. I just encourage you to figure out what your system needs because it will be different. So like I said, I've already heated up all that water. It's sitting right now at the dough in temperature. So we're going to get that started. I've already added all those salts and things that I mentioned earlier. So let's go on over and dough in. So when you order online, you're going to get a whole bunch of stuff either in one bag or in separate things. So the best way to do this, I think, is just to add everything in kind of individually. All right, so this mash is actually super thick. Um, I'm not gonna be surprised if I end up with a couple efficiency issues here, but I should be able to more than make up for that with a little bit of table sugar additions. So we'll just keep an eye on our pre-boil gravity pretty carefully uh, and see how it goes during the sparge. But basically, now that this is all stirred up and all, there's, all the dough balls are broken up, we are gonna let this sit for 60 minutes now I have um, a little bit of a recirculation system that I built uh, a couple months ago uh, that I use. It's not at all necessary to make this beer. I want to stress that, um, but it does help out a lot, especially with these higher protein uh, mashes in terms of setting up the grain bed and making sure that you have a clear wort. So as always seems to happen whenever I brew, something goes catastrophically wrong. And in this case, the controller that I used to do my recirculation system blew a fuse. Uh, so now I'm trying to figure that out, but I got a problem because my mash is already at a low temperature 
and uh, our recirculation system is just not gonna work at all because uh, I have no ability to control that temperature anymore. The next best thing we can do is hook up the pump and the heat stick individually um, and actually just stand here and watch the temperature for an hour. Uh, so I'm gonna do that. <laughs> I have an analog thermometer hooked up to the tube that is pushing out wort at the very end of the system. So hopefully that gives me the most accurate reading uh, in terms of the actual temperature. It's dropped to 140 uh, right now, but I think we can salvage this. So I'm gonna be running the heat stick independently here and just plugging it in and putting it back uh, and then pulling it out and plugging it back in as I need to to try and maintain temperature. Uh, the best I can do is probably plus or minus five degrees. So I've plugged in the pump and the heat stick both right now to be running 100%. Uh, and that's gonna recirculate this mash and get it back up to the actual intended mash temperature. And then once that happens, I can actually start that hour long timer by keeping the heat going uh, for kind of on and off, manually checking it every couple of minutes. I was able to keep it between 140 and 155. I'm not really sure what the actual consistent temperature was in there. Measured the gravity kind of consistently throughout it. I think I'm in a good spot. So I'm gonna go ahead and start collecting the wort now. Um, and uh, hopefully we end up with a decent pre-boil OG. Okay, so we got a pre-boil gravity of about 13.3 bricks, which is about 10.53 for a gravity. That's actually only two points lower than we were aiming for, so despite everything breaking, I still somehow managed to pull it off within a decent degree of efficiency, so I'm pretty happy about that. Uh, so we're gonna go ahead and move on to the boil now. Okay, so we've just hit our boil, as you can see, uh, and I'm gonna add the 60 minute bittering addition here, which is this uh, ounce and a half of citra hops. Put those in and we will wait until 20 minutes are left in the boil and then we'll add more hops. All right, so it's now 20 minutes from the end of the boil. So we just got to add this uh, one ounce of citra and that's all we got to do. We'll come back in 10 minutes. All right, so now it's 10 minutes from the end of the boil. So we're going to add a whole bunch of things. So we're going to add our uh, 0.3 pounds of table sugar. Just going to add that gradually, try to make sure we don't end up scorching it and creating a, a caramel mess on the bottom of the uh, boil kettle because that would be bad. So I want to avoid that. Try to stir it up pretty nicely. And the last thing we're going to add is a crushed up Whirlflock tablet combined with some yeast nutrient. All right, so the other thing I'm gonna do around the 10 minute mark is uh, start recirculating boiling wort through this chiller and through my pump. That's gonna sanitize the inside of the chiller and the pump, of course, assuming that they're clean to begin with. All right, so now it's 10 minutes from the end of the boil, so we're gonna adding this one ounce of citra one more time. All right, so the boil's done. Uh, I'm gonna kill the heat sources in a second here, but I'm gonna start the chilling water now. And we're going to bring this down to about 180 degrees uh, and we're going to try to hold it there as best we can for the entire uh, whirlpool. All right, so uh, we have chilled everything down to about 180 degrees and I stopped it there. Uh, so we're going to hold this for 30 minutes as best we can. We're going to continue the recirculation, I think, but uh, we're going to do our best to keep it at 180 degrees. Uh, so we're holding this for 30 minutes, right? So the first Whirlpool addition is going to be the 0.6 ounces of citra. That's going in now. 
All right, now it's time for our 20 minute Whirlpool edition. So now we're gonna go ahead and put in 0.7 ounces of Citra. And wait for another 10 minutes. Okay, so now we have obviously done 10 more minutes in the Whirlpool, so it's time to add our final addition, which is uh, the 1.2 ounces of Citra. And now we're gonna wait for another 10 minutes and then we'll start completely chilling this and transferring it over to the fermenter. The fermentation really should be uh, the standard ale fermentation, which is a temperature from 65 to 68 degrees for about two weeks. Um, it's gonna be pretty easy. However, there's also a dry hopping involvement here. So I'm gonna do two ounces of Citra uh, dry hopped post fermentation. So uh, with a New England IPA, you're typically gonna dry hop uh, about three days in, which is the biotransformation range where the yeast and the hops actually interact and create some interesting flavors. Uh, but in a typical West Coast style, you're gonna dry hop after the fermentation is complete. So what's gonna happen is I'm gonna let this sit for about seven days and then and I'm gonna dry hop for another seven days. And the way I'm gonna do this to avoid oxygen transfer, I have actually set up my hop bag already. Uh, this is a stainless steel object under here which has been sanitized. I have a stack of neodymium uh, rare earth magnets up here. These are exceptionally strong magnets. So once the dry hopping needs to happen, I'll just pull these magnets out and they'll drop the bag into the beer and I don't ever have to open up the fermenter. What we're gonna do is ferment it 65 to 68 degrees for two weeks straight, dry hopping after the first week for a full week, and then I'm gonna put it in the keg. All things considered, this brew day was actually pretty hectic. I had that controller break down on me as soon as I started the mash. So that caused some issues. And then I also had a lot of issues because I'm trying to film the tasting video for a cream ale uh, at the same time as brewing. So like my camera card actually ran out of memory completely. And then I actually ran out of battery after that. And uh, it's just been one thing after another. This brew day has been a pain in the butt. Um, I'm really hoping the beer turns out good though. Uh, it's, it's been a lot of effort to put this thing together, so hopefully it does. All right, so the word has cooled down to about 70 degrees now, and I'm just transferring over to the fermenter. Um, it's very important to ensure that we have enough dissolved oxygen into the wort so that the yeast have enough oxygen to uh, reproduce with effectively. So the easiest way for me to achieve that is to just simply splash the wort into the fermenter and create a ton of bubbles. This has always worked pretty well for me in the past. Uh, as you can see, the, I mean, the color of the beer is actually kind of darker. I mean, we did use a whole pound of Munich malt, so I'm not super surprised by that. It's like kind of like a medium orange looking color. Um, after we add our dry hops, I'm pretty sure it's gonna be somewhat hazy actually as a final result. Um, not, not looking like a pale beer here, but we're also gonna have a decent amount of malt complexity. So I think it's gonna be all right. All right, so now here's our uh, decanted yeast starter. We're just gonna pitch that right now, um, the whole thing. All right, we'll cap this up and let it ferment for two weeks. Again, with our little dry hopping magnet configuration. Uh, so, all right, original gravity looks like it's about 17 bricks, which is 1068, um, which is low. It's actually quite low uh, compared to what I was expecting. Uh, so obviously I did take an efficiency hit here. Um, we're gonna ferment it out anyway. Uh, I was kind of shooting for 1075 actually. Uh, it's a shame I didn't hit it, but it's um, so what happens when you have a crappy brew day. All right, so this uh, actually turned out relatively low. It turned out at about uh, 1.009 for our final gravity, um, which is quite lower than I expected. So that kind of makes up for the uh, lower than expected OG. So we actually still have a technical double IPA on our hands here. I think it's probably somewhere in the region of 7.5 to almost 8% ABV. So we're kegging this tonight using my closed transfer system that I built myself in the video that you can see in the top right hand corner if you're watching on a computer. All right, so a lot has actually transpired ever since the uh, brew day on this particular beer. So first of all, I did fix the controller. Uh, that is a 20 amp, 250 volt fuse, uh, slow blow, which is actually pretty easy to find and very cheap to replace. So I just threw another fuse in there after I got some. 
um, and it has been working fine ever since. Uh, so I think what happened was when I started that pump up, uh, something occurred such that the pump ended up drawing a lot more power than typical. Sometimes on the spin up for a pump, you can actually draw a ton of current, uh, especially if there's a lot of resistance going through that pump. That, either way, that's what happened. Um, we had an overload on it and uh, I replaced the fuse a couple days later and everything is fine. So I'm actually currently brewing an amber ale with that set up right now and I haven't had any blown fuses yet, so fingers crossed. So fermentation, on the other hand, went pretty fast. I, I know I said two to three weeks uh, when I was talking about it on brew day, uh, but because I had such a big yeast starter on this thing, it actually ripped through it in under 10 days. Uh, so anyway, we went through the first five days. Um, I saw that the Carlson had fallen. So then I dropped those dry hops in by just removing the magnet on the lid that you saw and it dropped the bag right in without ever having to open up the fermenter, which is great. Um, we dry hopped West Coast style post fermentation for about five to seven days, I think. I honestly can't remember, <laughs> but it was for something on that order of time. We kegged it yesterday and then I force carbonated it last night. And uh, well, now it is ready to serve. It is very young, very fresh and very tasty. And uh, you will notice when I pour this that it is quite dark for a hazy IPA. And that is because I used that whole pound of Munich malt in it. It is almost orange. Uh, but on the other hand, it has a ton more malt flavor than your typical hazy IPA. So I think it's a win. So all around, it's a pretty good beer. And uh, I think we're gonna go ahead and pour it and talk about it out in the porch. All right, so I called this one overload because of what happened to my controller. Uh, yeah, so it comes in at 7.8% ABV and 84 IBUs. So the appearance of the beer is pretty hazy. Uh, it looks like it's kind of an orange to deep gold color. And uh, the head on it is very, very creamy, very clean, robust, and somewhat off-white. Uh, it is definitely leaving some pretty awesome lacing and uh, overall staying in place for a long time, which is great. Uh, definitely want to contribute that to the flaked oats. Despite having a pretty hectic brew day, this actually turned out to be a decent beer. So I'm pretty happy about that. Uh, so moving into the next category, which is the aroma. It's a very, very strong, dank hop aroma there uh, that is coming through. It, it's dominated, absolutely dominated by the hops. The two ounces of dry hops that I threw in definitely produced a very, very aromatic beer. Yeah, so I get a lot of melon, grapefruit, and tropical fruit, kind of like a papaya, perhaps. It smells kind of like a fruit punch. And uh, you could definitely tell it's a hop aroma. I mean, it's got that little bit of hop character to it as well. And uh, yeah, overall, it smells amazing. So now I'll go in for the mouthfeel. Yeah, so it's like a medium to full bodied mouthfeel, actually. Uh, it's, it's got a lot of contribution from the flaked oats. And also I, I do think that 7.8% ABV is definitely not masked at all. Uh, for what it is, it's, it's relatively creamy and pillowy in terms of mouthfeel as well but it does have a decisive hop bite, um, which is characteristic of West Coast IPAs, less so of the East Coast. So now let's go in and talk about uh, flavor. The first thing I will mention is that this does have a very aggressive bitterness. If you're expecting this to be like a classic New England IPA, you're gonna be in for a bit of a surprise. Um, the bitterness on this up front is aggressive and does not mess around. I think it is just a hair under being too much. Um, I say that because I am a hop head and I have a relatively high tolerance for high IBU beers. I like bitter things. But um, that bitterness goes away. It's sharp, but it goes away fast. And at the end of the day, we're left with a really nice, complex, malty profile here. The little bit of caramel malt in there accentuated a little bit of sweetness on this and also the Munich malt that I added really made a very big difference in terms of both color and flavor. It's got this kind of bready, doughy kind of backbone to it. The carbonation level on it's kind of like a medium level, so uh, it doesn't really drown out the flavor too much. And I think it's nearly perfect for that style. It, uh, in terms of hops though, the hop flavor, it's there. It's definitely juicy. 
uh, on the back half. If you could get past that first aggressive punch, then it's very juicy towards the end. And that's more of that same aroma quality, the melon, papaya, citrus kind of thing. I do think by far the most prominent hop flavor coming out of this is a strong grapefruit. Um, and in not, not really in a sweet way, you know. It's pretty good. It just doesn't really look the part of a, you know, typical hazy IPA, but I think it shares a lot of characteristics with Lunch from the main beer company. Uh, it's a pretty famous kind of darker colored hazy IPA out there. Um, very good beer, by the way, but totally different hop bill. Um, I don't think they use any Citra in that, actually. I think it's Mosaic, Amarillo, and Simcoe. Um, but this has less of that pine character, more of that citrus character, uh, but the grain bill is nearly identical. Uh, and I think this is actually a pretty cool alternative for people who are looking for an hazy IPA that's not necessarily super pale uh, and has a little bit more malt flavor to it. So if I had to go stack this up against my New England IPA that I made a couple weeks ago, I actually probably would say that this is better. Um, it's just got more flavor overall in terms of the malt and the hops. Um, the New England IPA itself had more hop flavor. I'm a person that likes West Coast IPAs and I like bitter beer. Um, so this definitely fits in a nice little middle ground between the West Coast and the East Coast styles in terms of balancing the bitterness with the hop flavor and in terms of balancing the malt complexity with the haziness and uh, the flaked grains and flaked adjuncts. Uh, I would definitely brew this again. It's, uh, it's tamed itself down a little bit since I first kegged it. When I first kegged it, it had a little bit of a stronger alcohol presence. Um, but it's not there anymore, which is good because I was ready to say that this had been a little hot fermented, um, but I really don't think so anymore. I think that was just a young beer talking. It's definitely pretty drinkable overall, but it, it's a pretty full-bodied beer, so it does feel kind of like a meal. So I know I threw Whirlflock in this anyway because I didn't really know what I was targeting, hazy or not, at the end of the day. But uh, adding those uh, dry hops and definitely adding the uh, flaked oats uh, really does guarantee you a haze. So in recent memory, I made an All Galaxy IPA, which uh, was actually awesome. That beer was really, really good. Uh, and I think, honestly, Galaxy is probably still my favorite hop. I think it's got a better flavor than Citra does, but Citra's got it beat in the aroma department, uh, at least for me. I think that that is probably that fruit punch smell with a little tiny bit of dankness on the back. Just, it, it's awesome. I think if you wanted to make a single hop version of this beer and switch it out Citra for Galaxy, and they did the same malt bill, that would be a winning combo right there. Um, if you really want to make the best possible version of this beer, I'd say use Galaxy in the late boil and then dry hop with Citra, and uh, it would probably be really, really good. Um, Citra's not, however, the cleanest bittering hop, and I think that's definitely coming through here. So I would definitely bitter with something maybe a little bit cleaner, or perhaps some Simcoe. Uh, Simcoe's got good bittering qualities, and uh, maybe some Cascade if you're looking to kind of keep it on the West Coast, East Coast balanced side. Uh, I really like this beer. I really do think it turned out very, very good despite the circumstances. And I would highly recommend making it to anybody else who wants to try this type of thing. Um, I do very much encourage keeping uh, oxygen exposure at a minimum during this whole thing. But as you can see, I still did it in a bucket fermenter. And I know some of you guys out there are gonna get very upset about that. <laughs> it seems to happen on all of my hazy IPA videos. Someone tells me I'm wrong for using basic equipment, but I want to ensure you that you can still make a fantastic beer without that. I'm gonna go ahead and give this one probably a nine out of 10, and I'm only docking points for the fact that Citra's not the greatest bittering hop in the world. But then again, this is a single hop IPA, so yeah. All right, thanks for making it all the way to the end of the video, guys. Uh, I really would appreciate it if you gave this video a like and gave my channel a subscribe if you really like watching this kind of stuff. So it just makes my channel more relevant to YouTube and it makes my content a lot more easy to discover on YouTube as well. So hopefully people are getting something useful out of this. Uh, let me know in the comments section below if you uh, ended up actually brewing this beer or something like it or just want to discuss any uh, characteristic of the beer. I do read every single comment and I do my best to reply to all of them. Um, I just do work full-time jobs and sometimes it's not immediate. So I do regularly upload videos every one to two weeks. Uh, that does depend on my brewing schedule and how frequently I can brew and how quickly I can empty kegs. Uh, but typically it's every one to two weeks that I'll kick out a video. But if you want more frequent updates, I have an Instagram. It's at the apartment brewer on Instagram. And there I will post every one to two days and you will see what's happening in real time 
what I'm actually brewing at the moment and what will come to the YouTube channel in a few weeks from when I post it. And uh, last but not least, in the description box down below, you'll see a complete recipe for this beer as I brewed it. Uh, so if you want to try it for yourself, it's all down there. There is also a complete list of all of my brewing equipment down there, along with links to Amazon where you can purchase it for yourself if you're in the market for any new equipment. Uh, just be advised that if you do actually purchase something through one of those links, I do earn a very small commission on it, but it's at no additional cost to you, and it does kind of help out this channel in a monetary way. So I do appreciate it if you do choose to do that, but no pressure. So anyway, uh, I'm going to go ahead and finish off the rest of this uh, surprisingly good double IPA. And I'll catch you in the next one. So cheers, guys.